Welcome to the webinars, number three in my series. Uh, stoked to have a, a guest here to talk to as well. Uh, we've got Mr. Matthew Gilligan this evening, but before I get into that, I've got to do the, the normal disclaimer stuff. Uh, this is not financial advice. This is uh, commentary and rhetoric and ideas. Uh, we're going to tell you exactly what we think, but don't take it as financial advice. If you need financial advice, please see a financial advisor. Now, if you've been on live in one of these webinars before, you will know that on the right-hand side of your screen, you can actually type in questions, type in anything you like, um, bang it out now if you like to tell us you're alive and you're online by telling us where you're watching the webinar from, if you like, uh, put that on, on the right-hand side now. Um, glad to see so many people on board and made it. This uh, webinar series has been more and more popular every week. People are crying out for some idea of what's going on out there. And that's why I'm so stoked for this evening's uh, guest. We've got Mr. Matthew Gilligan, Chartered Accountant for 25 years, Trusts, Entities, Trusts, and uh, I would say the normal accounts and stuff, but he's bloody amazing at what he does. And also a very talented uh, long-term property investor and developer and author of a couple of books on property and tax and structures. Uh, welcome along, Matthew. A very kind words, uh, Steve. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me along. Absolutely, of course. And, um, and right back at you, by the way, you're very good at what you do. I've been so impressed with your um, online presence and, and your workshops and your guidance of your students over the years. You're doing um, a great job there. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I've, I've really enjoyed working with you for God, the thick part of a decade and a bit now. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yep. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, great to see people jumping online from all over the place. Tauranga, Otahuhu, uh, the Deep South, the Mighty Browns Bay. Great to have everybody on board tonight. We're um, sort of three, four hundred deep already, expecting to get to five or six hundred people online tonight. So, as I said, if you do have great questions and things, even dumb questions, shit, let's hit, let's hit them all. Um, bang them into the comments there, and we will do our very best to get uh, to get to that. Just now, to remind us, um, Steve, I've, I've got one of my um, professional colleagues of GRA arriving at eight o'clock. He'll be a surprise for us, so we'll be able oh, to yeah. be able to chat to him as well. Nice to have a special guest. So um, this evening uh, was pitched as talking about DTIs, and we are uh, actually absolutely going to get into debt to income restrictions very shortly. But something very topical happened today with the Reserve Bank, the OCR result, as predicted by everybody but ANZ. They left the Reserve Bank interest rate hit as it is. What do you, what do you think they got up to there, Matt? Well, people asked me what I thought would happen, and I, and I said that I thought they would hold hold the OCR. I thought, you know, my view is if you want to work out what the market's going to do, just do the opposite to what ANZ and Westpac say. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I reckon they're just sucking up to the regulators, those guys. They, they just, um, they say some crazy stuff. Um, and do you remember um, at, at the top of the last boom after ANZ pumped as much debt as they did into the market? They came out and said that um, New Zealand investors were a disgrace and that they, um, you know, wouldn't tolerate f further bad behaviour from New Zealand investors. Their, their CEO was pushing it back on the market, but yeah. who lent the money? They lent it. So um, I, I haven't. Um, I'm not a huge fan of of, of what their economists say. I, I quite like Jared Kerr. He seems a bit more measured. Um, and, and I, I do think that um, the Reserve Bank reports quarterly and. There's a big lag between what's happening on the street getting reported to them, yeah. and 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 that, that I think is a disconnect. But I'm, I'm very pleased that they didn't push rates up today because what we're seeing is blood on the streets. We're seeing distress in households. Uh, we've got a large client base, ten thousand entities we had before, um, and we you know we're a good paravane, a good barometer for what's going on. We we get a front row row seat to it before it's reported in the yield, um, and and you know sales are down. Consumer spending's down. Our, our clients are hurting. Um, our property clients are not are not able to sell if they're exposed to the spot rates as they come off their fixed interest contracts. It, it's stressful for them. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so a, a theme I've been talking to you before come online tonight. Um, I'm really um, very unhappy with the Reserve Bank and Adrian Orr uh, and and what they did post COVID. Um, you know, they pumped the market. Um, with low interest rates and loose liquidity, really overdrove the market low. A five-year-old could work out it was going to create a massive house price inflation problem. Yep. Um, nonetheless, it made the government of the time very popular and the Reserve Bank popular. And, and here we are um, two, three years later, 
uh, the rug has been pulled out from under investors. The Reserve Bank is grinding the hell out of households and businesses, causing no end of harm, I think structural damage, to fix Adrian Orr's inflationary mistake of 2020. Uh, it's terrible. Yep. And, you know, make no bones about this. Our Reserve Bank governor made a mistake. Uh, he's not a he's not a steady hand on the tiller of the economy, and he's pumped the hell out of the housing market, created a massive problem in New Zealand, and we're paying for it now. We're suffering, um, and it, it, the instability is coming out of the Reserve Bank. The um, the actual banking institutions have done a sterling job. They they stress tested it three times the interest rates on the day, um, and, and that's actually what's holding the banking system together, not the Reserve Bank governor's good guidance. Um, because now we're facing interest rates at triple um, with the ACR being pushed up um, and the banks have planned for it and you know self-regulation is, is working, which is why I'm, I'm unsure that we need the DTIs in New Zealand. I, I think that the banks are doing a great job. We're the envy of the, of the world, um, our banking system for its stability and for its low default rates. Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, um, Good move, not pushing rates up. I think that was jawboning, and 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 you know, fair enough. They need to quell inflation. That is the, the medicine that, that the country needs to get rid of inflation. But um, rates need to come down, and they need to come down quickly because we're doing structural damage. Example: um, This morning, one of my team here, Celeste Chand, is a partner at GRA. Um, he was speaking to a doctor. I wrote this down, and um, she was giving a reference to a colleague, Steve, who was migrating to um, Australia. And yep. on, on the form, there was a very clever box, tick if you would be interested in, in migrating to Australia. So she ticks right. tick the box, the recruiter handed her, long story short, um, she got offered a role over there, double income, less hours, and she's off. Wow. And it so, was, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so it's rife. We're losing our talent over there because the Reserve Bank is just making New Zealand hell um, for, for many households. Of course, if there's no debt in the household, it's not hell, but um, a lot of people just getting on the property ladder or getting out of university or getting going um, that are exposed to these rates, it's, it's hard here and, and incomes are low. So it's it's not it's not good. We're doing structural damage. Developers are going broke at the moment. Uh, they would otherwise have survived if rates were kept low. Um, so we've got peak migration. We need to be building houses. These developers are going out of the market. Um, yep. Yeah, it's yep. it's just all upside down, and it's interest rate driven. And, and, and Adrian Orr is seemingly getting credit for fixing the catastrophe that he's created himself. Oh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and 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 we've got one hundred sixty five thousand net immigration, but the people that we are losing is all of the talented people that are prized offshore, yeah. and 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 we're replacing them with less talented immigrants that we absolutely 100% need to keep the economy moving. Mm, mm. Um, but, but as you say, we've got nowhere to put them. They're, they're talking 165,000 net immigration, 100,000 landing in, in Auckland alone. Um, and I'm just sitting here going, well, where, where are these people going to live? Um, resource contents have halved. Developers are running scared because they can't sell the stock they've already got to start new stuff. Um, mm. and, and, and my pitch is that what, yeah, my, my thing is after three cycles in the economy, what happens next? What happens at this part of the market? And in this part of the market, what happens next? And you can see it on Trass's property cycle is a boom in rent. And when rents boom at this point, yep. your tenants can't afford it. They're just not well, keeping that, up. That's exactly what's going on in Auckland. You've got um, you've got huge demand from all the immigration coming in, but it's but they can't afford to buy the houses. A lot of them are not permanent residents, so they can't get OIA approval to buy the houses. And I don't see a lot of economists talking about that, but that is a problem. So they're coming in, temporary migrants, uh, they can't buy, so they rent. Massive rental demand. Rents are going through the roof, I know, because mm. my portfolio in Auckland's benefiting from that. Um, and and that's bad. And so you you lose the demand stimulus to developers because there's actually surplus housing stock sitting around. It doesn't sell because there's no rental return. Um and it won't be until the rents get up to a point where we can entice the developers back in or much more likely interest rates come down and you see that demand stimulus um, return. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. got to be interest rates coming down. It's the biggest stimulus package that the property eco economy has. And, and um, you know, they've got more tools with loan value ratio restrictions, but they're only tweaking those very slightly and it just doesn't make any difference except for people like yourself and me. 
um, loan to value ratio restrictions of 5% tweak only helps you if you've got 10 plus houses to any, to any measurable amount. Yeah, yeah, so it is interesting. John Key this morning, um, he, he said that house prices, he thinks, will double in the next 10 years, and yep. it kicks off the second half of this year as um, interest rates get dropped. Um, and, I, and I actually think that's one of the key pieces of DTIs, which um, we're going to discuss, not to preempt it tonight, and that is that when DTIs come in, um, it will open options for the Reserve Bank because they'll be able to drop interest rates and, and take the pressure off households without creating house, housing bubbles because that's when yep. they'll be most active. Yep, more tools. Love that. Well, um, so we're talking about official cash rates, talking about interest rates. We know there's a lot of people out there going to come off 2 and 3% over the next 12, 24 months. What's your recommendation for people that have to go to a floating rate of 8% or fix at 7.5%? What, what advice would you give people um, if they were had half a million dollars coming off onto a floating rate in the next sort of six months' time? Easy to get this advice wrong, so talk to your yep, uh, financial agree, advisors. Agree. Um, uh, but I think it's pretty obvious rates have to come down, or or it's going to kill the New Zealand economy. Um, and so, and, he'll, and if he doesn't bring them down, he get thrown out. So, um, so I would be fixing short, and and if you can if you can cope with that um, for six to ten months, you'll be you'll be in the money next year. So don't take the long rates; you'll regret it. Mm. Agree, and I think that they're trying to entice us with lower, slightly lower, longer rates because they know that that's what's going to happen as well. Because you know, banks are all about shareholders and making profits. So if I had a half million dollar mortgage at the moment like that that I was worried about, I'd do half, maybe half on six months, half on twelve months. But the yep. first thing I would do is speak to my mortgage advisor and get some solid advice. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Well, look, um, we we said we're going to talk minutes, about in twenty minutes. My mate's going to turn up, so I want to rip through some stuff before he does. Excellent. Let's do that. Right. Uh, quick intro. I'm Matt Gilligan. I am MD at Gilligan Row, uh, who are property accountants and general chartered accountants. So we act for businesses and uh, property people. Um, people like us, we're authentic in that we all invest here. Um, Celeste Chan and myself and two of the partners, we have sizable uh, property portfolios buy to hold. Uh, we develop houses too. I did an 80 lot subdivision in um, Darfield last year. Um, I built eight houses in Auckland last year. Uh, I'm building a lot more this year, um, so I'm quite um, I'm quite buoyed by what I see in the future. I'm I'm consenting and setting up my my contracts to, to build at the moment. I'm not I'm not pushing the button on the builds till I get a feel for what happens later in the year. But I would say second half of this year I'll be building. So when you talk with us, you're actually dealing with people in the market doing stuff um, that makes us authentic and uh, makes our advice real. Um, we're doing what you guys do. So a little bit um, about DTIs. What are they? Uh, well, it's a, it's a um, it's a debt ratio. Sorry about the typo in that slide. I whack these together quickly this afternoon. It's a debt ratio um, that looks at the your debt um, and multiplies it by uh, the it multiplies the debt ratio times by your income to get the maximum amount of debt that you're allowed to to borrow. So, um, for example, the Residential lending in New Zealand is going to be fixed at six times your income. So six times 100,000 means you'd be able to borrow 100,000 of residential debt. Um, and if you are investing in investment properties, the DTI is seven. So seven times the same income would give you 700,000 of debt. Uh, so if you wanted, uh, if you wanted a, a bit of both, you might say you would need 200,000 of income to fund 1.3 million, 100 for the 600,000 on your home, and 100 for the 700,000 of debt. Great, and that's gross income, Matt? Um, yep, and there is a question mark over whether they need to scale the investment income or business income. So they might take 90%, but that is yet to be advised. Excellent. So these are proposed rules uh, under the Reserve Bank's consultation paper. They are not in, um, and they have exemptions, which I'm going to discuss in a moment. 20% uh, of the bank lending can, uh, can exceed these rules. Yep. So... Um, and that's on, on both sides. So 20% uh, of bank lending can exceed these rules. So that does give the bank some discretion. Uh, along with these, that the Reserve Bank is proposing to ease LVRs slightly. So 20% um, of LVRs will, will be able to be um, greater than 80% for owner-occupiers, and that's up from 15%. Yep. And investors can have 5% of LVRs above 70%. 
so this is proposal. So that's up from 65%. Um, so and and so that you'll you'll be able to have 70% LVRs as investors and 5% of, of um, lending will be able to exceed that. So you know, looser LVRs that, that will take some of the pinch of um, DTIs coming in. Uh, I, I did wonder where these came from and because I thought, gosh, who, who's doing this, the government or the Reserve Bank? And it's actually Grant Robertson uh, under the um, financial remit uh, con consulted with the Reserve Bank and said, yep, uh, you, the Reserve Bank is allowed to bring these DTIs, DTIs in uh, and that is part of the broader objectives to su support more sustainable house prices. Um, and it's also about bringing in a debt servicing ratio as a as a guard, if you like, to um, to stop the banks from going off the rails. Um, and they'll be they'll be they're intended to bite, uh, not at all times in the in the housing cycle, but at peak times. So when house prices run away because everybody goes crazy and starts buying houses, and interest rates might be low, for example, um, and so appetites to to borrow suddenly um, emerge. Uh, these DTIs are intended to slow down the, the amount of lending because you've got uh, to increase your debt, your income has to go up and, and keep pace. So, it, you know, in that regard, it, it will constrain the housing market um, during boom times. Rest of the time, it shouldn't actually bite too badly, um, which, I, which I think is a constructive thing. Yep. Um, the, why would they do this? Well, and I'm... I'm uh, copying and pasting straight out of their consultation paper. Uh, there's a clear link between house price inflation and credit growth. Um, Adrian Orr uh, proved this in 2020 when he dropped rates to 2.5% um, and loosened LVRs to 80%. And you know, you, you increase credit and loosen the, the ratios, uh, Kiwis will go crazy and start dabbling. And post COVID, that's exactly what happened. So the idea is that if we say, well, you can only have six or seven times your, your income, then um, you know you might you won't be allowed to go as crazy, and the the growth should be more moderate and spread out over time. Um, so that that is the idea, and I think it's a good idea um, in that regard. Um, so they they looked at the current investors and current households at and looked at the level of uh, the the debt to income ratios at the moment as they stand. And they found that at the moment, uh, only 20% 20 20 of investors have debt to income ratios of greater than seven to one. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, first home buyers uh, are right down at 10, uh, but sub 10 um, for six, six to one DTIs and even less for seven to one. And that, that horizontal line running through the middle is at 20%. And pretty much everybody's under, under, 20, um, under seven to one or, or six to one, um, well and truly. Um, so they're making the point that uh, bringing these ratios in will not have much effect on existing borrowers because everybody's below these ratios already. That actually and, brings us to a good question there. Um, Alan asked, will it be proposed ETIs for existing lending or new lending only? Uh, we're going to cover that in the exemptions section, but the answer is uh, it's new lending only, ex existing lending is exempt. So you'll be able to refinance existing lending and you won't have to qualify for DTIs on it. Which yes. is sensible, yeah. Yeah. Good question, Alan. Um, so the international experience, which I won't go into too too deeply, the international experience uh, has been that house prices still continue to grow after DTIs come in. Um, they're, they're all over the place. Um, in Ireland, it's three point five to four. Uh, Czech Republic, um, eight to nine. Latvia, six. Norway, five. Um, and, and in all of these countries, the experience after uh, DTIs have come in has been that there has continued to be growth. It's just more moderate and more spread out. Yep. So, you know, I, I, I don't like regulation. I think the market's efficient and um, smart and works it out. Um, and, and, it, and no better example than our bankers. Uh, but in, in defense of DTIs, they haven't caused trouble overseas. Um, to any great extent, and and so I don't think that they're a terrible thing. I don't think we need them, but I don't think they're a terrible thing. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think I'd, I'd say that you you would observe that the impact by area will be variable. If you're in an area that has very low incomes uh, and high average values, like Queenstown is the is the poster child for that. Mm. Um, but with a, a DTI down there of about eight to one. Um, 
you know, that that's going to be they're they're above these proposed TTIs because regionally the incomes are low and, and the asset values are high. But then you'd also observe that people in Queenstown that own houses are rich, probably don't have any debt. Um, and, and in that respect, two thirds of New Zealand don't have any home lending. Um, only thirty two percent of New Zealand has a mortgage because, of course, a bunch of New Zealanders are, are tenants. Yep. Uh, and the average DTI across New Zealand is about three to one. So it demonstrates that um, most people don't care about this. It's people on the on the margins of uh, lending who are pushing it. Um, probably our clients, Steve, who are key no key on yep. property and, and pushing it. Um, but, you know, DTIs are going to vary by prevailing incomes and house prices by area. Um, and so it won't be the same effect across the country. Auckland's obviously a tough area because assets are so high. So just a, a few general comments. Um, exemptions. Um, so old ending is exempt. If you're refinance, you, refinancing your existing debt, uh, DTIs don't cover it. It's new debt that catches you. And when they look at new debt, I think they have to, and, and I'm guessing, because, and I've spoken to a few bankers and, and this is their opinion, but everybody's guessing because these are draft rules, right? These are consultation paper rules that's proposed. Yep. So you got, you're refinancing your existing loans. You don't want any more money. DTIs don't apply. You want yep. some more money because you want to buy something else. So you want to upgrade your house. You have to now qualify under DTIs. Uh, construction loans and loans for new builds are exempt. That is so important. Otherwise, yeah. property development will stop. It will stop um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to skew the market because everyone's going to buy new builds to get um, exempt of these rules. Um, so more, more, more positively for new builds, right? With the tax exemptions already there. Uh, bridging finance, Kyangaroo first home loan schemes are exempt. Business loans are exempt, um, and commercial property loans are exempt. Huge for commercial property. Yeah. So this is this is another beat up on resi lending. Um, it's not necessarily a bad beat up, but it is it is it is not helping secondhand housing in New Zealand. Um, I, th I think the um, exemptions are all, um, you know, sensible and uh, they will take the sting out of DTIs. And the way the way they've been set at six to one and seven to one is, um, you know, sensible. They're not going to come in, sting the market. If suddenly the market ramps up, they can drop them down as a, as a tool and, and stop the market going crazy and just spread the growth out which would have been so much better when you think about it with Adrian Orr, if he if he dropped the rates to 2.5% and had DTIs at 5 or something like that, uh, we would have had more moderate growth and we wouldn't have had the boom crash. Um, we wouldn't have had, had to suffer the recession and mm. have all the structural damage from pushing people out of the market, you know, migration to Australia to get away from it, businesses going broke. Wouldn't have had all that structural damage if with DTIs in. So I'm not a huge fan of DTIs. I don't want to come in. I don't think we need the regulation, but um, there is that argument for them. Now, now, Matt, question for you. With six to one and seven to one, six to one being for uh, owner-occupier property, seven to one for investors, th those are going to act at the same time, correct? So you're going to need to sort of do some calculation and go and figure out what six to one is on your family home and seven to one is on everything else? Yeah. And so I think, what, I think what I'll do, uh, an example, um, uh, but a, a lovely client of yours and a client of mine, mutual client in from New Plymouth during the week. She's probably online. Uh, she's earning around 60 grand and yep. she's about 340 grand with a debt. And so at the moment she's compliant. Um, uh, but you bring in DTIs, uh, she, it's home lending. So she can borrow six times 60 grand, 360. She had about 340 grand with a debt. So she's now got liquidity available of 20. She won't be able to, be able to borrow more than that. Right. Currently, a bank might let her borrow ninety percent with um, with a uh, low equity loan, ninety five percent, and she can take that out and put that as a deposit deposit on another property, and and get on that property out there and get a second house. Now, okay, a bunch of New Zealanders would say that's terrible, that's risky. We would say that's um, you know progressive for that person. Ten years time, that house is going to be worth more. She's not going to go and buy an average house, average rent. She's going to target a high income property, um, multi income stream property. She's going to be smart because she's yep. supervised by you. Um, and so, you know, she's getting a hit and, and she won't be able to do that under these rules. So I think what she'll probably do is she'll move out and then it becomes investment debt. She'll get seven to one. So it's going to be distortionary. Mm. You'll see more people moving out of their home and renting it out and, and that sort of nonsense. 
Um, and there'll be gray area, like if you've got all your rooms rented out and just one room's you're in it, is that a yep. rental property? So all that yep. stuff's going to come and it'll be, yep. it'll be messy. You'll also get people downgrading to a smaller asset and then buying a bigger rental property with a higher income because it'll massively distort the DTI that they can borrow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to change behaviour. I, mm. I think it's going to, going to be hard. Um, and one of the biggest impacts of it is it's going to be hard for people getting a start. So yep. if you're, yeah, you come out of uni, um, your income's the lowest it's ever going to be, or you're a tradie and in your first few years and you can see a property boom's going on, you want to, you're just gagging to jump in there. Previously, it was LVRs holding you back. Now it's LVRs plus DTIs. So great Fine. for boomers, great great for us. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're um, oh, you're a boomer, Steve, I'm not. Um, so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so. But all the other rules still exist. You know, you've still got uh, sensible finance rules. You've still got triple CFA. You've still and, yeah. and still still the biggest issue that most investors have is is servicing, is being yeah. able to prove the income that they've got, particularly if self-employed. Yep. Yeah. And you 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 look at New Zealand as I said at the start. Um, we're the envy of the world with our with our bank um, banks, which are re relatively unregulated. Mm. Uh, they they have um, the, some of the lowest default rates in, in, in the in the world. GFC we sell to it. We're sailing through this, relatively speaking. Do you see? Do you see blood on the street? Do you see mortgage sales in the banking system? Not really. It's, the default no. rates are quite low, um, and that is because we've we've got LVRs and the banks um, test at servicing rates much higher than the prevailing rates in the market. Yeah. Uh, so why why are we bringing these in? The the bank the bankers are the adults in the room. Actually, all of the instability and the volatilities come out of the Reserve Bank. Not the banks. The, the, mm. the banks saved New Zealand. So, Prudential Lending Code and um, the senior bankers uh, are actually the ones that um, have have made New Zealand so resi resilient in, in recent times. I yes, guess I you, mean, could, you could argue triple, triple CFA um, has has helped, um, but the banks were already doing it. That's just an, yeah. that's just an interventionist stuff. It's like Muldoon era um, central government uh, stuff. I don't like it at all. Let, let the adults in the room run the banks. They protect their shareholder capital. They allocate the capital efficiently. What you're going to see is with these rules where a banker now would give the benefit of the doubt to a young person, maybe a young professional. They know their income is going to grow. Um, they they know they're of solid character. That person would get the benefit of the doubt under the current rules. Under, under DTIs, they're going to have to slot into the 20%. Um, and that twenty percent, I think, will, be, will get sucked up by the fat cats that uh, are pushing it because they're the most profitable uh, members of the bank. DTI is starting to like a um, uh, a safety blanket we don't need or a, an airbag we're never going to set off. You know? Yeah, yeah. Mo just just more um, more regulation that's not necessary. You can argue mm. that it has some merit. I'm not saying it has no merit, um, mm. but uh, you know, I just think it's more. More regulation, we don't need it, and it's a hangover from the Labor government. Um, the Labor government wanted to regulate everything. Um, it's just not necessary, you know, especially in the banking system. Uh, so, so, how much of the market is it, is it actually going to impact? Because I, I did, I did the, the the worst analysis on my Facebook page recently and said, could everybody jump online and figure out what their income is, multiply it by seven, and tell us whether they're at the DTI line or not? And yeah. hardly anybody was. No, nobody was maxed out. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the distortions will come, right? So if you're on the line, then you'll suddenly become a property developer because that's exempt. Right, yeah. Claim, claim GST out of, out of your houses, bang, you're, yeah. you're, you're out of them. Are we um, ready to look at exemptions then? What, what is and what isn't exempt then? Uh, well, I, I mentioned them. So commercial property loans, business loans, um, loans for new builds, construction loans. So, you know, you yeah. take your residential loan and flick it into um development and straight away it's out of dti's so yeah. so there's lots of wiggle room in there and, and that's why i'm not too worried about these rules I, I i think um they are set at a level that's sensible that's not going to impact the market as it is but actually if the market goes crazy because they drop interest rates they can they can then dial back the activity of the market yeah um, so so I, I actually hated these rules for the last three weeks um and <laughs> and as i've studied them and thought about them more and more i'm thinking mm -hmm. Maybe they're not that bad, <laughs> um, and but I do feel for people just getting onto the property that ladder. They're, they're, it's quite socially re regressive in that regard, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And I guess the banks would say, well, the 20% is for them, but uh, we'll, we'll wait and see where it actually goes. Well, well, as you say, this, somebody with a first income has one form of income. They have a salary, they have a wage, whatever. I, I look at you and me and we have multiple incomes. We have salary, we have shares, we have some some debt with some rental income coming from it. You know, it, it's kind of a free ride for, mm. you know, for those of us that are more established. It's very hard for the newbies, for people getting stuck in. Hey, Steve, can you see backstage? You can, eh? Just, yep. just with my guest yep, arrived. Nothing yet. So, so just to repeat, I think... Um, one of the biggest positives is the Reserve Bank's going to be able to drop interest rates and control the runaway house price inflation. Yep. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest case for them, quite frankly, because uh, at the moment they've, they've got this blunt instrument of the OCR. Um, they they squash... Um, uh, our, our guest is here, if you want to bring him in. Okay. Mm. Not at the backstage yet, so... Yeah, he's only going to talk for two minutes. Okay. So I, I always wonder what's going on with the politicians. So I've invited a politician who's a friend of GRA's. Um, he's about to show up. He says he's backstage, Steve. No, can't he's see him from here, sorry. Can't see him. Oh, there he is. There he is. Hold on. Do you want me to throw him on? Yep. Excellent. Hi, guys. I hope I'm coming through okay. Hey, Mr. Seymour. How are you? Well, thanks, and uh, thanks for um, hosting me here. Oh, very good. Uh, uh, this is the Honourable David Seymour. Needs no introduction, but he is the uh, head of the ACT Party. Um, David, you won't, you may not remember, but um, Steve Goody is a friend of mine. And oh, yeah. Nice we're to see discuss, you. We're nice discussing see. DTIs, and I was just saying that I've been hating DTIs for three weeks, but in the last sort of week I've been thinking, oh, maybe they do have a role. Maybe they're not quite so bad. I, I hate regulation and interference in the market, but I... Um, you can see some some benefits of them for stopping runaway house prices. Um, but well, I wanted to invite you here to uh, give us a view on DTIs and see where they're going. Yeah, okay. Well, look, thanks again. Um, a couple of things about what I can and can't do. Um, so I'm part of the government, uh, but the Reserve Bank's independent, and there's a couple of uh, connections. There's the charter. Uh, there's also um, the financial uh, policy uh, remit that the Minister of Finance gives. So in theory, um, you know, our government's a coalition. We can say to the Minister of Finance, Nicola Willis, hey, what are you doing about that? Um, so she's sort of got some ways that in theory uh, she could intervene, um, but not really direct on something as specific as DTI. So I think that that's the first thing that I know people will say, well, this is, you know, Labour want to regulate everything. It's a hangover from Labour. Um, yep, you can make that argument. They did appoint Adrian Orr. Um, I'm sure that they have influenced the tone um, of the, the government and its policies, even the Reserve Bank, to some extent after six years in power. Uh, it was great because Robertson gave them that remit, didn't they, in 2021? So that, that that's out, right. So, so right now... Yeah, right Right now they're under a financial policy remit set by Grant Robertson. That, that's also true. Um, so in some indirect ways, you know, the government of the day can influence them. But, you know, it's, it's basically a good thing that monetary policy, if you saw the decision today, um, and uh, prudential policy that we're talking about now uh, is done by the bank um, and it's independent from uh, the politicians of the day. Because if you think it's bad now, believe me, uh, it could have been worse. In fact, in Muldoon's days, it, it actually was. So I just say that not as an excuse, but just because those are the, the basic facts and I, I don't want to get people saying, well, why don't you change this? Um, we've set up a system where politicians are one step removed and have some indirect ways of doing it. Um, so in one sense, um, what I think about it uh, doesn't matter a, a huge amount. Um, but since you asked, I'll just give you a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is that uh, the headline's pretty shocking because I just kind of sit there and think, you know, what are people I know in Auckland earn? Um, what is the um, people I know who might be first home buyers in? Um, and I know my seven times tables, um, and I know that uh, they ain't going to have a house anytime soon. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that, um, you know, a, a Reserve Bank would do that. Mm. Uh, and yet, as you've sounds like you've got to from the bit of the discussion I heard, um, there are a few exemptions. There are proposed changes to the LBR at the same time. So the practical effect on first home buyers may not be 
um, as bad as it sounds if you just get out with your seven times tables and say, well, that, that doesn't stack up. Because yeah. um, you add your rent to your income there and and, and so that, that, you know, that, that adds cumulatively up and makes it a bit easier. Yeah, so I just I, I just give people a bit of pause that, you know, it's worth looking at the nuance of it. And, you know, in fairness, the Reserve Bank is consulting. They're not going to announce anything till mid-year. Um, the second point I'd make is that while I've got every opportunity to do this, it's not up to me to judge them or, or direct them. Um, it seems to me that we have another example um, of policy that is really treating the symptom. Uh, you know, I think there's a big, obviously, in this in this particular forum, people will be pretty pleased with the growth in property prices over the last 20 years. Um, but no, I really, well, probably less so in that period. Yep, yeah, fair. Yeah. Um, it's minus 20%. Yeah. So. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I bought in March 2021. So I, I'm, oh, I've I've got more than a, I've got more than a passing interest in, in recent property price trends. Uh, should, have however, to should have come to GRA. <laughs> well, you, you probably would have told me that there's no, no time like today. Um, <laughs> but in, 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 in any event, um, you, you know, so, so obviously while people were generally pretty keen in this group for property prices to appreciate, and I understand that, um, you, you know, I worry about what this means for New Zealand's long-term social cohesion, because if you've got a group of young people sitting there saying, well, actually, I don't see a pathway to being part of this society, um, then they're going to do one of two things, either move to Australia or vote green. And to be honest, it would be safer if they moved to Australia. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the ultimate concern you got there. Uh, so, Did you, did you hear my comments around that person migrating to Australia this, um, that Slash met this morning? Did you, did you? I didn't, no, no. What was that? Uh, just a doctor that's a client of ours um, was writing a reference for one of their friends and there was a, a tick box in the form, would you be interested in migrating to Australia, ticked it out of interest. Recruiter rang them, immediately offered them a job, double their New Zealand income, less hours, no yep. weekend. Yep, off. so, so that, that's one of the realities we face, right? So, like, first of all, you, you want the next generation to see a pathway, and if we don't make it easier to build homes, that's not going to work. But just about everything that every government's tried up until now, I hope, if, if fact gets its way on a few things, um, every government has basically tried to treat the symptoms, LVRs, DTIs, special home grants, uh, mm. you, you know, the, the fiddles, they've put, you know, taxes on landlords, tried to punish landlords in a whole lot of ways, actually. Um, mm. And that fundamentally doesn't change the fact that there are more people than houses. You can change, you know, the advantages or disadvantages of different people in the community in the short run, but you can't change that long run problem. So fundamentally, we're not into demand side measures in housing. It's been a massive waste of time and annoyed a lot of people. And a lot of that stuff we're now reversing. You see the bright line test pretty soon. You'll see an announcement around the details of mortgage interest deductibility. You see landlord changes. Um, and so we're going to dismantle a lot of the demand side stuff then start doing the infrastructure funding and financing the RMA, the things that allow you to actually solve the real problem, which is building more housing. So I just make that comment about this is a another demand side, you know, symptom treating uh, policy. Um, and I just make one other comment before I run because I've, I've got to go. But, um, you know, the, the, the example of your, your Aussie doctor or your soon to be Aussie doctor, um, you know, the issue is New Zealand's in a bit of a hole because we need to be wealthier, we need to have lower taxes, and we need to find a, a competitive advantage somewhere uh, that makes people want to come here, bring their skills, stay here and have a future. And it seems to me the one thing we've got uh, is that we've got, you know, a really nice climate overall. You know, if you've been to Perth, then you probably think, actually, I don't, I'm not sure I do want more heat and sunshine up, on balance. Um, and uh, then you say, well, look, you know, we've got great uh, natural beauty, you, the, the, the ability to have sand between, between your toes, grass between your toes. I mean, for a lot of kids growing up, up around the world, that's an unimaginable luxury. For Kiwi kids, it's pretty normal. Um, no crocodiles, no spiders, no sharks, no jellyfish. No Australians. I mean, there's very few Australians. <laughs> um, all of that. Yeah. So, so what's the big competitive advantage we can give? This is a place where it's easy to build a home. And yet yeah. over the last 30 years, we have conspired to do just about yeah. everything possible uh, to make it as difficult as possible and in a place that should have the big competitive advantage of, look, New Zealand, it's isolated, small population, few drawbacks, but go there because you'll get a house. 
Um, yep. and, and that's how we get those doctors and we actually manage to get more productivity, more economic growth, allows us to provide the social services we need and lower taxes. So if we don't get that infrastructure, land use, consenting, building part right, then we're basically giving up probably the one big advantage that we have as a society. Anyway, um, there endeth the sermon. Um, and, um, a good sermon. Just, uh, that's, that's where, that's where we've got to be going. Yeah, and, and on behalf of GRA, thank you very much for coming and listening. GRA are big ACT fans. We promoted it ACT at the last election because we think, we think David is the voice of reason. Thank you, David, for coming. Yeah, just, thank as the way. Thanks for coming. Okay. Have a great night. Thanks thank very you. much. Good luck. See you. Bye. Well, that was good. There's a bonus. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sorting that out, uh, Matt. Um, yeah. yeah. Big ACT fan. Last time I met him, I was uh, interviewing his um, co-leader, in the beehive uh, just before the election and had a quick word with him but um yeah so a lot a lot of sense going on there a lot of practical he, sense. He, he can be quite sharp if, if you disagree with him um he can be quite sharp. <laughs> he bites he bites i've had a couple of cross sword sessions with him and, and that's um, what we need and he's, and he's not wrong how many trees do we grow and yet we can't build bloody houses yeah well, um, do, do you know what he was going to announce he was going to talk about then he was talking about the edges of it Right. They're yanking the chain out of, out from under brands. I've, I've heard it through my client base. So Love brands too. is going to be smashed um, because there's such a conflict of interest. All the owners of brands, uh, uh, you know, the controllers of brands are the suppliers. There's a, you know, they're, they're pulling that apart is what I've heard. And, mm. and big changes at KO as well. So I am... Um, well, with KO being under such investigation themselves, I mean, you, you were talking about John Key earlier, and, and it feels like John Key was the last commercially logical leader we had in this country in, in all reality oh yeah he was awesome yep um and he yeah yep. um so I, I was running my way through my list but we might move to tax i think i've done it um, um you know i've talked about roller coaster interest rates and, and the problems with those in our reserve bank governor what can you do to prepare um yep. So if you're on the edge of your servicing limits, you might need more funding. You want to do it before uh, DTIs arrive, because once DTIs arrive, it'll get, it'll get much harder. Um, you might want to look at non-bank lenders. Um, looks like I'm on my own. Steve disappeared. I oh, know there he is. <laughs> so, so exemptions um, for non-bank lenders. So second and third tier lenders uh, are exempt from these rules, the same way LVR restrictions? And any bank that's not regulated by the Reserve Bank, like GM Home Loans. Um, so there's some yeah. big holes in this, the same way there was with tax deductibility and LVRs then. Yeah, but th those those non-bank lenders, um, they're about 0 0.7 higher than the than the main bank lenders. So yep. you pay for it, but you'll get out of out of um, regu the um, regulation by doing that. Yeah. And and I would just say the early bird gets the worm if you are in that 20% of um, investors where you're exceeding seven to one, uh, you want to be talking to your bankers earlier, not later, um, yeah. if you feel you need more. So I, I you know, I, I think these are unnecessary, these rules. I don't like yeah. regulation. I like to leave it to the adults in the room. We don't need the government telling our bankers what to do. They're doing a great job in New Zealand. But as far as making the best of the worst of it, these rules coming in, um, they're actually pretty good. And yeah. I don't think they're going to have a, a terrible impact. Um, and they may actually provide um, some some welcomed uh, controls when we have rampant house price inflation, and they're going to let the government drop interest rates. I almost sound like I like them, don't I? <laughs> yeah, but also, like, I mean, as they bring DTIs in, they're also removing uh, non-deductibility um, right through to, what, 2025, I think the last of it comes off. Um, well, that's next so, time. Yeah, sorry, uh, preempting you. Go. No, that's one of good point. So, so the the quick pricey of the government changes on on the table at the moment so bright line national are saying they'll reduce the the period to two years they've made a media release no detail the, the devil's going to be in the detail yep. um what i would what i we are asking at gra is will it be dropped across the board on all property with retrospective effect most likely but it could be grandfathered in where you get stuck with the rules at time of acquisition so if you bought yep. a property prior to the rule change if you own property now does do you maintain that 10 year historic um, yeah, which, which is most likely. Let's be fair. No, I think I think they're not going to do that based on what they've really? said. Yeah, but I think they're going to. Whenever they ever not. Well, they phil philosophically, um, I I believe think that it's wrong. We this is a backdoor capital gains tax. It's it's capital gains tax and drag. The Nats think that it should be two years. I've yeah. actually argued with um, Paul Goldsmith and Chris Bishop and said it should be five years. 
because uh, it gets all the clandestine traders and um, and that's a good middle ground. But yep. no, they're in, they're in it too. So so I actually think um, that's going to be um, welcomed relief. It's proposed to come in one July twenty twenty four. Uh, we're at what the 28th of Feb, so the detail has not been announced, but but that's on the table right now. We don't know yeah. enough to comment, but uh, that should be a positive. Uh, the next thing is uh, interest on deduction rules, which you just mentioned, Steve. Uh, these have been announced by the coalition to uh, to be phased out from uh, from actually this year. That yeah. line one of that is. Um, is actually incorrect. The coalition announced that this financial year would be 60% deductible from 1 April 2023. That was the headline. Then 80% from 1 April 2024, next month, and then 100% from 1 April 2025. So that was a year early, and a year early, early, earlier than we were expecting, so that was great. Uh, but then Nicola Willis is saying that the timing on this is being... Uh, discussed and they're going to push it back um, potentially um, that that's being discussed in, in cabinet so I was l listening to David then seeing if he was going to give us a heads up on what that's going to be. No, it's fine for uh, her now she's sold her house yeah yeah so the deal is going to be in the detail of this you know timing maybe plus one year and what happens to historic interest deductions denied are they going to release them you know because you know, you've, you've got a bunch of rentals set away they haven't they haven't let me deduct them are they going to let yeah. so are they going to give them to us we'll find out that's you know lots of questions so the trust tax rate this is the third thing um it's actually nicola willis not julia <laughs> these are my draft slides I'll, i've put my draft slides up not my final <laughs> slides <laughs> um so that so nicola willis um has picked up the the labor implemented proposed change of the trust tax rate going to 39 percent and uh, and so this is supposed to be from 1 April 2024 and right up until yesterday, everybody that has retained earnings in companies owned by trusts that are taxed at 28% has been um, declaring dividends and flowing them up into their trusts so that they pay the 5% top up tax rate between the company yeah. and the trust tax rate, which is currently 33. So the current tax rate 33 of trusts is going to 39. Everybody's flowing the earnings up so they don't have to pay 11%, they pay 5%, which is the current difference in, in the tax rates. But And then Nicola Willis last night came out with something very helpful. Uh, it recognises what the uh, what CANS, uh, which is Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, our, our professional body for Chartered Accountants, uh, lobbied for, they went in and lobbied for a two-tier rate that recognises that actually most of the beneficiaries of New Zealand, 80%, are not exposed to the $180,000 tax rate. It's, I think it's 19% are exposed to that $180,000 um, tax bracket in aggregate for the for the families. So why are we forcing trusts where the average tax rate of the beneficiaries would be under 180 to pay tax on 39%? So I, Willis has, has been receptive to that, and she has said that they're looking at um, a two-tier rate, which will allow trusts to flow um, income, receive income below a threshold at 33% potentially, and then above a threshold at 39%. So that will be very helpful. Uh, what is unhelpful is we're a, we're a month from the end of the financial year, and uh, we don't know whether we should declare dividends for our clients or not because we, we don't have detail of this stuff, so it's not helpful. Crazy. But uh, but good on that the Nats for doing that. They're listening to feedback and being responsive. Um, so so that's good. So these are two tier rates uh, for the twenty twenty five financial year, and um, you know it's it's a very good thing. I've just explained that slide. It's a very good thing. The two tier system will will help taxpayers in New Zealand. And that's it. That's that's my lot. Fantastic. Um, that's some really interesting stuff. Um, and uh, thank you so Seymour's much for your speaking. Seymour's always good. Yeah. Oh, what's, so happening, good. what's happening at your event, Steve? You've got a boot camp, is that right? We do, yeah. So um, really, like once or twice a year, uh, we put on a very big boot camp for property investors. We try to get 350, 400 property investors in a room and get uh, yourself, Dave Winler, some of the best speakers in the country to come on. And um, obviously, we've got this going on on the 17th of March. Uh, so it's coming up fairly shortly. Um, we can only get 300 people in the room. Uh, we've already got well over 200 tickets booked. Um, 
we've called it the previously the cash flow bootcamp. We've changed that a little bit to the succeed in property bootcamp this year, just to recognize how much of the new content we've actually changed, rewritten, because there's just, as you say, like tonight, there's just so many new rules and things that we have to take into consideration now. Um, and we are looking at this as a major update to the property market. Um, so massively, massively upgraded for 2024. Um, we are hoping to have more of the detail that you're actually talking about, but we want to show people exactly where it is that us and our clients are actually making money in property at the moment. And, that, and that's exactly why we've got you to come along and speak as well, Matt, because um, I think portfolios will transform quite a lot in 2024. I don't think the way that you and I made money in the last few years will work for the next few years. And so we need to look at everything fresh and new again. Um, and so that's exactly what we're doing with um, rewriting so much of the content that we're putting on. So, Actually, Steve, uh, Steve you, you've worked with companies in the past that I've also worked with, uh, and that was their failings. They they didn't change as, as, the, as yep. the market conditions change. You know, it used to be you'd go and buy a house in Otara for 30 grand, then they were 60 grand, then they were 120 grand. I've seen this in my career. Uh, then they're 240 and at all stages. Um, you know, people were saying, this is crazy, it's not going to work. And then they got to 1.2 million last year and it didn't work. Yep. Yep. And so you need to do something else. And you guys change your strategy with the market conditions. I like it. Oh, we, we change it with every event. No, no, no two events are ever the same because when I bought my first house for $80,000, something, you know, 28, 29 years ago, um, I had to put down a $7,000 deposit. And now first home buyers are putting down $750,000 for, for an awful house. And they have to come up with $200,000 up front. And so the strategy has to change. And you can't just keep doing the same thing, expecting to get the same result when the market's changing so quickly, which is why we're going to grab six or seven of our clients that we're working with who are actually buying houses right now and how they're doing it and put them on stage with a microphone as well as an investor panel so that the people that come to the event as well can actually see from people because it's easy to imagine that Steve and Matt can buy houses, but people want to see what the everyman's doing and how they're doing it out there in the marketplace. Um, and we want to show that as well. So it's, it's a full day and it is a complete boot camp. Boot camp in the sense that we are physically there to teach people how to do this stuff and show them how we're doing it. So we're bringing in the relevant experts. Obviously, Matt, we've got you coming along and you'll be able to expand on a lot of the stuff that you've spoken about this evening and also talk a lot more about taxes and structures and remaining safe because a big part of wealth creation isn't the creation part it's actually keeping it and keeping it intergenerationally as well and i know Trust that all of that, yeah oh, and and all of the presenters and speakers that we'll have on stage have their own children now starting to buy their own investment properties and a lot of those kids and that next generation Will actually come along and be at the event as well and uh that, that's something that's really close to my heart uh after having helped my son at 20 buy his first uh, property as well and i know that it's important to dave windler who will be our lending specialist on the day figuring out how you can borrow money to buy investment properties and he'll actually be standing on stage and presenting that along with his son who is a mortgage broker with him as well so that's such a good thing to do for your kids i i bought i've got i've got a 18 year old and a 12 year old and i bought them rental properties three years ago um and when they come out of uni the growth on those properties means they can sell them buy their first home yep. um, and you know it's cost me nothing D doing exactly what what you guys do buy renovate revalue recycle take the money out and then let the house go up and value cost me nothing and Ritz free, and ride, free ride for the kids and you're preparing those kids for being wealthy and for creating their own wealth and, and having financial resilience, something that the school system in this country just entirely ignores. Um, huge responsibility. Being responsibility. I, I've got my son, one of his houses um, is mouldy, and um, he's looking at me like I'm going to go and sort it out. I'm like, that's your job. <laughs> you own it. Uh, and, and, and the next thing, too, is obviously that. Uh, if you're if you're a part-time or a full-time property investor you, you just don't get a christmas party you don't have a network normally and so what we like to do with this event too is really heavily promote actually networking with other people so we have tables of 10 people you'll be sitting with random other property investors you'll be having chats with them during the break and we want to promote that idea 
bring along a pile of business cards, introduce yourself to the 10 people around you. And to make that happen even more, I'm going to buy you lunch if you come along to this event. We're going to put lunch on so you don't have to leave the room. You don't have to go and find a little cafe somewhere. And you can sit there with a plate of food and actually have a really good chat to the other people around you because you might be a buy and hold investor and you might be sitting there next to a developer who can help you out and help you understand how they're doing what they're doing um, and the network that you create out of an event like that is nearly as important as the information that you will be delivered as well now in an important announcement that i haven't said before i've also got ed mcknight coming along now you might know ed as the person who runs one of the busiest business podcasts in New Zealand history. They have millions of downloads. I've just been on there for my second time. Ed McKnight and uh, Andrew Nickel, who work at OPS Partners and uh, work with property investors every day, it's going to come along and do a market update and tell you exactly what they're up to and what they're doing and how they're doing it. And this is a new speaker um, and something that I haven't launched or released to anybody else yet. This guy talks really fast. You'll have to keep up. And he is a lot like Matthew here, where I love the way he talks and I love the content he gives because he's just never wrong. He is very, very sharp guy. Oh, and that's kind of, I, I am wrong sometimes too, Phil. Just to correct you there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've actually got a list here, but I wasn't going to mention yeah. it. <laughs> but Ed's bloody good. I, I, I've only recently yeah. um, connected to those guys. Well, actually, we're given, um, pretty sure we're given tax advice, some of their boys. But um, yeah, it, it's on the money. I like him. He's yeah, sharp. He's, good, he's good an numbers. economist who also invests, much like yeah. yourself, an accountant who also invests. He's a very tidy guy. Now, obviously, there's always going to be an offer coming along, and we want to do a really, really beastie webinar offer for my clients who are online tonight, my people from my database, and also the massive amount of GRA people that are online tonight as well. And we want to give you an advantage because you took action and showed up tonight. We had nearly 600 people online tonight, and um, it was great to have a guest speaker and have that surprise pop up. But the offer that we're going to do tonight is going to also include, for anybody that's not a GRA client currently, a $500 gift pack, essentially, um, of an initial meeting with GRA. Now, I've had these. I've recommended them to all of my clients. And I send people through to this who pay this sort of money every week to uh, sit down with one of the GRA associates or partners and figure out exactly what and if anything they need to protect themselves and their wealth and their equity for themselves and future generations. I think this product as such is a must have for every investor. There's no commitment to this whatsoever. It's just a sit down and a chat. They do it usually via what Google Meet or Skype or online. So you don't have to actually physically be at your office. Um, and we're going to do that free for anybody that buys a ticket to my event tonight but only to people that are that are not current GRA clients. What we are going to do for everybody is give you a 100% guarantee that if you come along to this event, sit there for the day, turn up, listen to the content and listen to the education that we provide. And if you don't learn something, if you earnestly feel that you knew everything that you heard and we don't give you that one aha moment where you go, actually, Steve, that's bloody useful, then we will give you 100% your money back. You can watch the entire event start to finish, go home and email me afterwards, and I will refund your money if you are not happy. That's how confident we are that we have new and interesting content that you have never heard before that should be of great value to you as a property investor. So here's the deal we've got. We've got 50 tickets. We've got 100 tickets left. So we've got 50 tickets for the people on the webinar tonight, first in, first best dressed, and we will give you 50% off the ticket price. Now, we've got a link here that will automatically take you to through to the booking page and give you the 50% discount. All you need to do, step one, is go to stevegoody.com forward slash webinar. It automatically loads and it applies the 50% discount for people that have been on this webinar tonight. The link is uh, been put into the comment section there, so you should just be able to click on that, go across to the page, and be able to get that discount right now. And then all you do is come along to the event, learn in full steam, and we will show you everything that's going on in 2024 in property and show you why cash flow is so important at the moment. Show you all of the loopholes for loan to value ratio restrictions for DTIs, show you all the loopholes for tax deductibility, show you why nobody should not consider buying a new home, but what are the shortfalls of that and how does it affect your portfolio? I've also got a very, very new piece to the presentation that I'm 
halfway through writing at the moment, which is about not managing a portfolio, but building one from scratch. What should house number one look like? What should number two look like? How do you get to 10 houses, 20, 100? How does your life change? How does your lending change? How do your structures enter these tax change when your portfolio is brand new, small, medium, large, huge, and how that should look for you as well? So that's the deal. SteveGoody.com forward slash webinar. You run over there right now for the first 50 people. You get a 50% discount and come along to the event. Now, the last thing that I was going to say is that this was supposed to be a three-part webinar series. I had a suggestion come to me via uh, Messenger today, and I agree with it. We are going to do a fourth webinar, and it's going to be getting started in property investing for absolute newbies. This is for somebody who's never owned a house before or owns their family home and no rental properties or family home and they accidentally have a rental property. We're going to work on webinar next week to walk you through, 6th of March, 7.30, walk you through actually being a brand new property investor. Now, I'm going to launch that on my Facebook page, give you guys a link as well so you can register for that and give you some reminders as well. If that sounds like you and you want to be the first guy, the starter guy, jump on that one as well. In the meantime, what Matthew and I are going to do while you guys are grabbing your tickets to that is we're going to go through some of the questions that you've posted and um, have a quick look there and roll through, see if I can find any curly ones that Matt can't answer because he loves it when I do that. Let's have a look. Um, I'm, uh, in the uh, I'm in the fridge, Steve. <laughs> That's why I muted myself earlier. Um, when a DTI is proposed to come in, um, if it is brought in, will it be this financial year, next financial year? Where does it sit? It's calendar year and uh, middle of the year. Good question. I should have covered that. Um, middle of the year, it would be the earliest. So they're going to yes. go through. They go through the consultation process, um, and, and I, I think the Reserve Bank are gagging to reduce interest rates, and so they'll want to bring these in quite quickly. But the middle of the year is when they're expecting. Mm. What was that? Do you think they're smart enough to know that, the, that, that this is the, a way of getting interest rates to come down? Oh, I think they are, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, they are. Mm. Okay. Um, another question here for Richard. Is it likely people with large portfolios and significant debt will be reluctant to sell as they won't be able to get further lending? Interesting you ask that because I've been debating that. Um, um, I, have, I have a reasonable amount of debt, um, Celeste and I, between us and... You know, we we thought, oh, maybe we should sell some, leave leave some powder dry, um, so that if there is a bit of a correction, we can buy back in. And so we've been debating that for the last month, um, and then we sort of concluded that we shouldn't because I think I think the Reserve Bank's cornered. They have to drop rates. Yep. They they're grinding Kiwis. It's very unpopular. They're leaving, they're going overseas. They're going broke. They have to drop rates. Yeah. And as John Key said this morning, you drop the rates, house price is going to go. So they're cornered, right? So this is a tool that lets them drop rates um, and control house price inflation. So I, I don't I don't think we should be dumping assets at the moment. But it's, you know, what do I know? That, that's just my um, educated guess. Talk to your yeah. bankers and your brokers. I think it'll be interesting too. It'll be an apples for apples thing. I think I think that sometimes people will go, look, I'm, I'm, I'm nudging that seven times limit. I can't go and buy a new property at the moment they'll look at second tier lending and and not not be a not be appeased by the interest rates not like that very much so they'll possibly do a portfolio review and they'll look at any assets they've got that are past bright line test they're not going to be taxed on it and the lowest rental return they can possibly get and they might exit that investment to go and buy a better quality investment if, if the market sort of turns a little bit i think that could be a way for people to sort of get out and get back in again yeah. once it, and it's only going to trigger possibly a two-year bright line at that stage, which should, should be a lot. You know, these questions are really situational, Steve, because, and, and mm -hmm. it's got to be bespoke to the household. So um, the, a household that has fixed incomes and, and is on the outer margins of their capabilities, um, they might sell. Yeah. Um, you know, they might cash up because they're, they're, more, they're at risk. Um, you know, more sophisticated investors that can switch the debt across into... Uh, property development or repurpose it over commercial property. Mm. Um, you know, if I can do that, I'm, I'm, I'm a developer, I've got commercial property, uh, I can repurpose and shift debt and get it away. Um, yeah. So, so you know, um, also uh, we, 
we took five year fixed interest contracts. Um, so we've still got two, two and a half years to go at 3%. So it's not, not biting. So for us, in our circumstances, we're not concerned. We think that rates are going to drop down. Um, and, and But if you're sitting on 8% and you're stressed to hell, then uh, it might make sense to, to do year. Yeah, particularly if you're sitting on eight percent with a four percent returning asset, and you can and, yeah. and prices start to reduce, and you can start getting an eight percent returning asset. Um, mm. It might be tempting. Um, just to mention that um, people are bounding through and grabbing their tickets now. JB's got a ticket. Uh, Dean's got a ticket. Madalena's mm. got a ticket. Trevor's grabbed theirs. Um, it's about ten tickets down now. So if you're sitting there waiting to um, grab your ticket to the event now, would absolutely be a great time. I think this question is is. Um, going to be kind of typical and topical of what we're talking about there as well. Um, Non-bank debtors. Yeah. yeah. Debt, um, debt repurposing. So, you yeah. know, got um, debt on your home. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, non-bank funding, non-bank lenders, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, Gem Home Loans um, is one. Res, Re, Resimac, I think. Um, is, is yeah. Pepper, so, I, don't I don't use them. them. I don't use them. But, but David Windler is all over this stuff. Go and talk to David Windler. Yeah. Yeah, he's had some very, very smart conversations with people recently, and, and like he's, he's just he's very good at uh, taking an asset out of a portfolio and making it debt free, so that you can take it second tier, so you can buy the new property and then take that new property from second tier to first tier within a year or two. You know, once it sort of settles down in your portfolio, as you say, slightly higher cost, but it gets it done. You know, and it, it, it enlarges your portfolio. Um, you got to watch tax deductibility on that sort of stuff, don't you? Correct, okay. yeah, if it's existing stock. But, I mean, that's changing as well. And, once again, there's a lot of exemptions. And, and it's filters, but amongst filters, it's it's incredible. Ben, um, if the, if the um, second-tier lender is um, – so the question is, does DTI apply to second-tier lending? Um, ben, the, uh, if the second-tier lender is not regulated by the Reserve Bank, and most of them aren't, um, then you're away. But main bank lenders, which are regulated um, – they do second tier lending. So if, if you're dealing with BNZ, um, my, one of my bankers, uh, you know, they, they do a lot of second tier stuff um, as past, of, they'll do first and seconds um, with different divisions, you know, they're regulated. So, yep. But if you're using that money for new builds or construction or commercial property, uh, then it's exempt. So yep. it doesn't, doesn't apply. So generally, if you're dealing second tier, I don't think it'll apply because you, unless unless you're using second tier to, to buy and hold residential housing, yeah. And yeah. even and then, then, if you're refinancing it, existing debt, it doesn't apply. So there's so many exemptions. And, and and even then, like um, we've got a lot of Australian banks in New Zealand who are starting second tier lenders and lending money. So ANZ, for instance, might be lending money to a smaller lender that's outside of those rules and criteria. So it, it's it's kind of the wild west out there at the moment for those second tiers, which is great for investors. Um, we've also had uh, tickets picked up by Nikki. Thanks so very much. Great to see you. Peter's coming along. Peter, you've been before. I don't know that name as well. So everybody's grabbing their tickets, which is fantastic. Still on the page there. Um, oh, here's a question for you. Um, if you co-own investment property with someone, 100% debt and income will be allocated to you then when calculating DTI. Um, I'm not sure what the question is there, but yeah. But I think they're asking about the apportionment, um, and, yeah. I, and I think that it comes down to the percentage you own. So uh, the, the banks could do this two ways. They could allocate 100% to each of you, um, but with my lending, they pro rata it. So if I'm 50-50 with Steve in a, in a company and it owns an investment property, uh, they attribute 50% to me and 50% to Steve for the obligation. So they, they yeah. work out the income of the, of the entity, um, and then they attribute the, the shortfall, if any, 50-50. That's on existing rules. So DTIs, it's different, but I think they'll, they'll have a similar mechanism. It would be logical to do that. But no one knows autumn because um, these are the, the details that will come out of policy at the later stages of it being developed. Yeah. Okay. Mm. But I think they right. attribute. Mm. Yeah, and so um, are they going to scale rental income? For the case of these ETIs, or they're going to use 100% gross rental income, do you think? No one knows. I asked three banks. No one knows. Yep. Details, details. Currently renting and investing all new builds. Don't own my own house currently. On that existing lending, my DTI is under 7 to 1. So does it mean I can't buy my own house under proposed DTIs? Oof, tricky. 
there's going to be a hard calculation to be had there somewhere, isn't there? That's what I was saying before. It's it's not straightforward at all. It's confusing. So I think um, I think the you're wanting new debt to buy a home. Um, so they'll look at uh, a, a debt to income ratio of six to one on the new debt for your family home. Yep. And if your existing properties are new builds, they'll be exempt. So DTIs yep. uh, will apply to the new debt on your home. And um, it's likely to be a situation where a new purchase is going to mean that you need to bring all DTIs and LVRs and everything else into line for banking rules if you're using first tier lending. Well, this, yeah. this is going to, it's going to become more and more important to go and see a mortgage broker like Dave Winler, Chris Peterson out of your office, whoever it might be. And they'll yeah. sit down and look at absolutely everything you've got and figure out how to how to restructure it to achieve what it is that you're trying to get. Um, which I think it's just going to become more and more important. Yeah, it's a, it's um, a tr tricky question. I don't know the answer. Good question, yeah. Andrew. Um, yeah, it's it's tough when you've got <laughs> no detail whatsoever. Well, the, the bankers don't know yet, so um, how do we know? <laughs> well, it's, 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 still a, it's still a consultation. It's still a consultation. No. Mm. They're still making it up their mind. Um, it reminds you of the Labour government where it was, um, you know, they're making decisions based on a popularity contest. They look, they're reading the front page of the Herald before they make a de well, decision well, on it. But they didn't win the popularity contest with me um, or, or property investors, that's for sure. No. I remember run, running a workshop in, in 2020, 2021, um, post that second election, and they brought in interest deductibility. I've never been so angry in a webinar. I was frothing at the bit. Because um, because they said good. we won't we won't change taxes. We're just gonna we're gonna change bright line and um, they, I think they were changing the thirty the upper tax bracket to thirty nine and that was it. And Heather Duplessy Allen interviewed Grant Robinson and and he said no 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 I won't change it. And then bought an interest on deduction. And he said, well, yep. it's not a new tax, it's a modification of an existing tax. <laughs> I think I might have been on that webinar with you and I'm sitting here like not getting a word in, <laughs> trying to trying to go, well, he's either going to pass out or he's going to take a breath in a minute. <laughs> I, I was half I was half an inch from throwing shit across the room. I was so angry. Yeah. It, it, was, it, it, things yeah that, that's actually when we, we reached out to Seymour and, yeah. and, um, and we reached out to the Nats. Nats didn't reply, annoyed the crap out of us. Um, Seymour straight back and said, "Yeah, this is a betrayal," and um, and yeah, that's when GRA connected with Seymour, and we, and we yep. got behind them because he yep. was so responsive. He he's really good for investors. He's um, driving the revision of these um, interest on deduction rules. He's driving the um, revision of tenancy rules to allow no cause terminations to come back. Yep. There's some like a PC that. name for it, but essentially kick a tenant out without giving them yep. a reason. And you want to do that if your tenant is threatening the neighbours or making noise. You don't want to go to the tenancy tribunal and fight with them. You just want to say, okay, we've had enough, see you later. And then they know it's a veiled threat yep. and they behave. Yep. Um, but landlords are disempowered un under the labour rules. So he's kicking that out. KO hates it. It's disastrous for them. So. Well, um, as you know, I had a rental property recently where I had I had to evict the tenant for not paying rent. They lit the house on fire on the way out. <laughs> you can't make this up. And um, they're taking me to the tenancy tribunal because they want their bond back. Oh, well, I had a $40,000 bill for fixing the property. Insurance yeah. obviously covers it, but come on. Now, yeah. uh, we've just got a couple more ticket sales come through. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ross. See you there, Mel. Gareth has grabbed a ticket. Michael's grabbed a ticket. And that takes us to 26, so we're about half finished of the 50 half price tickets. So if you're still working on uh, grabbing that ticket, then jump in there, absolutely. Um, I, had a, I had a rental property in um, in Memphis, Steve. Remember, we were in Memphis together. Yes. And, yeah. you know, the FBI blow up one of my houses, so... Um, <laughs> That, that was hilarious. They, um, one of my tenants was on the FBI's most wanted list, so they smashed the front door and threw stun grenades in and blew the windows out and trashed the house. Just after I the back. Um, our manager asks, if you sell a property, will your debt need to be reduced to fulfill DTI rate? So basically, will they, if you sell a property and exit an investment, will they have to straighten up the DTIs? This is another one of these, we don't have any details things. But this is exempt because it's existing debt. Yeah, got you. Yeah, so no, basically, yeah. Yeah, no. But they, the bank might take it under Prudential Lending Code and think you're overgeared. Yep. 
any thoughts on this one then how are dti's proposed to uh, apply to a situation where you have multiple entities residential owned company owned by family trust is it going to cross those different entities or they're going to look at the one person globally yeah i think that they'll just look at it as a group and take your percentage pro rata share so yeah. if your if your trust owns 50 percent and your your mate's trust owns 50 your trust will have 50 percent attributed to it that would be logical and that that's how prudential lending code runs as it is um, so if you add DTIs into that prudential lending code, it should follow through, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, if you really want to nail that down, like if if under the loan documents you're jointly and simply liable, then each of you are 100% liable. But if you are proportionately liable on the loan documents, then that, it would be forced to be that way. But actually, yeah. I find the banks look at it practically and they say, well, two functioning parties, they can each pay their half share. Um, so they they practically take half and half that's what i find in my commercial lending yeah or resi yeah. Mm. great um another great question here what do you think matt uh that's it's your event steve you decide <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, bring them along bring them along we've had babies crying in the back of the room it's, it's a generational event you know i mean you know we're, we're, we're ringing uh dave windler and he's much older than matt and i so i mean that's only fair right <laughs> he's, not, he's not listening tonight um what other questions have we got? Nearly my bedtime, Steve. Sorry, mate. Just like last bed, yeah. Four or five more tickets just sold just then. People grabbing the last set of tickets. We've still got 350 odd people online uh, listening to these answers. So, you know. Because they all um, walked away and watched TV. There. There's no one online. <laughs> just you and me here. <laughs> I forgot to show up. How did you buy your kids' properties? Did you put them in a trust in their name sort of thing? Yep. So um, formed two trusts, one for each child, made those trust beneficiaries of my um, family trust and lent money to the family trusts for the deposits. And then the trusts lend the money down to a company owned 50-50 between the two trusts. So choice of investment vehicle was a company because with interest on deduction, you know, choice of the choice of um of the day really what was companies because you want to mitigate your tax down to 28 percent low interest yep. rate environment no interest deductions um you want to be at 28 percent um and then i want to be able to declare shareholder salaries to the kids so one share in each name in the company um, for work done um you've got to watch the minor beneficiary rules and trusts so you, you didn't think the question was that that complex did you <laughs> you got to watch I, the I, minor I, beneficiary I, rules Sorry. I know what the answer would be. The answer would be um, grab a ticket to my event, get a free consultation with GRA, and they'll tell you exactly how to do it. Because as you said before, it's never simple. And the answer that you've just given would probably not suit that person because yeah. a lot of stuff that you're doing is, is so incredibly bespoke because there might be an ex-wife or a half-cousin or a, you know, it's, it's everybody's situation is so incredibly different. Um, and you and don't that, know. That, that, well, yeah, the and the other thing is you've got to think about what happens when things change. So, yeah. You know, we could make that company LTC and run the income through to the trust and distribute it as the kids get a bit older. So you're yep. thinking ahead as well as the current circumstances. But a trust owning a company, a couple of trusts owning a company, two rentals in the company, that's the answer, Jane. Yep. And, and, and I'll answer this one for you as well. You know, if you've already bought a ticket and you would like to have a sit down, have a chat with GRA, just send me an email, stephen at stephengoody.com or message me on Messenger. And uh, if you've already bought a ticket to my event, I'll do my very best to plug you in with Matt and his team. It just might not be before the event because I know that Matt's incredibly busy at the moment. His lead in time has gone out a, a lot because there's a lot of people thinking about this stuff right at the moment and moving it along. But get in touch actually, with me. Actually, Steve, the market's waking up. Everyone knows interest rates are yep. going to drop. John Keyes yep. in the paper uh, is on um, breakfast this morning saying interest rates are going to drop second half of the year. Probably is going to go up. So I think everyone's working it out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely, they are. Um, excellent. What else we got here? Thanks, Stephen Mayer. L a lot of love for you bringing um, uh, our friend on as our guest speaker tonight. That was fantastic. Um, great to hear some stuff from the horse's mouth, absolutely. Um, we, I have recorded this webinar and I'll make it available. Um, we'll be using a bits and pieces because there were some absolute gems in there and there are still people sitting in that queue sort of uh, grabbing the tickets to the events as well. So fantastic there as well. Um, Oh, here's a good one for you, Matt. You're going to love this one. Crystal balls. What's happening with house prices this year and next year? What are you thinking? Uh, I think um, Tony Alexander is a year out. I think that um, 
I'd, I'd say um, flat first six months. There's still there's, there's still no liquidity. Um, I think developers are not going to be able to develop because bank funding's been withdrawn because um, capital adequacy ratios are, have changed for the banks and the rates are going up and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on restructuring inside banks at the moment. So liquidity is going to be tight. Interest rates are going to stay high. Lots of uncertainty. Um, yet rents are going to go through the roof and second half that'll spin around rates will start to ease off there'll be catch up um dropping of the interest interest rates possibly dti's in and that's going to create confidence um through all sectors in new zealand uh pe households will will feel the pressure coming off them as they've got more liquidity through lower interest rates and there'll, there'll just be a, a wave of feel good coming back into the economy as rates drop away and that'll really take off next year. So this year, muted growth, next year, lots of growth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of agree. I think five year, this, five percent this year, 10% next year, something along those lines. Yeah. And the reason for that being that um, just because people can't buy houses doesn't stop them from wanting to buy houses. And so if interest rates are high and funding's hard and bank liquidity is not great, there is a pent up demand situation where people want to buy houses as soon as they can, they jump in. Um, and I think that that we've we've seen that we've seen that a lot. Um, hey, look, uh, I'm not going to keep you here all night, Matt. You're you're a bit down, and you probably want to go home for your dinner. Um, I, I just want to thank you profusely for your support of my event, and obviously for the the great information and the guest speaker on the webinar tonight. Um, I think we're 41 ticket sales into the 50 that we had available for this tonight's webinar, and so. If anybody else is online tonight, there's all the information. All you've got to do is go to stevegoody.com forward slash webinar, and we will teach you an incredible amount of stuff on the 17th of March at Eden Park. Um, but in the meantime, thanks, Matt. Um, as always, bloody great to uh, work with you. Um, and you. Thanks for inviting GRA. Um, we we always, always appreciate working with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks to everybody else online tonight. Anybody else that uh, needs anything from me, then uh, just grab me. A, um, I'll be on here for a little while longer, and I'll let Matt go. Uh, thanks again, Matt. Really appreciate it. All right. All right, so there we go. Um, lots of questions tonight, lots of answers, uh, lots of bits and pieces. A very good special guest, which I thought was so good. I kind of knew that was going to happen, but I wasn't allowed to say it. Um, that was a really good information full webinar, and I'm stoked with that. And we will obviously next week do a very entry level investing webinar with getting started with property investing for uh, fresh, newbie, nervous, or whatever type of uh, investors. Uh, the link for that is will be um, on my Facebook page now at Steve Goody Property Coach. Other than that, uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thanks for the great questions, the positivity, the feedback. Um, anything else you need, just email me or contact me on uh, the Facebook page. Thanks everybody for this evening. Uh, I really enjoyed that. That was a lot, a lot of good fun. Um, and we'll see you next week for the next webinar in the series. Have a great night. Thanks very much. Bye.